Okay, if we can get to our seats, a word of advice. You can only get through on the what is my left side of the room at this point, so use that as your hallway. All right, so, hi, I'm Laura Cabrera. It is an incredible pleasure to kick this off, get this started after much delay. I'd like to thank you all for making the effort to be here given all of the um, required adaptivity to make it happen. So we're excited you're here, and I love that it's a full room, and it's going to be a great day. I just want to tell you a couple things about what we're doing today, a few sort of logistical things. Um, first, if you don't mind silencing your cell phones, we're in a small room, it'll help the speakers stay focused as they're doing their talks. Um, we, each speaker has 10 to 15 minutes, and what we will do is, as you will see from the agendas on your table, we have um, three speakers at a time grouped by a substantive theme. After all three of those speakers have finished their talks, we'll have a little bit of time for question and answers for the three of them together, rather than after each speaker. That'll help us move through the modified time frame. Um, so if you, do have a gen if you do have questions, jot them down, and we'll make sure you have a chance to ask them. Also, um, most importantly, we need to thank our primary sponsors, USDA Think Water Initiative, under the fearless and um, great leadership of Dr. Jennifer Kushner. Say hello, Jennifer Kushner. And of course, we really particularly have to acknowledge um, NIFA's long-term commitment to this work, and in particular, Jim Dobobrowski, our uh, national program leader for water, who's brought this systems thinking into water space. So Jim, I just wanted to say thank you to you. Shout out to Jim. <laughs> What's important is that both Jen and Jim are really committed to the idea that education is a tool for powerful change, and so I just wanted to make sure that we take note of that in this moment that we have struggled so mightily to bring to you that this is a, a, really, a really unique piece of work that you're going to hear about today. So um, I'm going to try to clip through this a little bit. I do encourage you to consult the bios on the website of each of our speakers. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the introduction so that you have the time to really read that. Um, what I will say is that each one of our speakers comes from an established uh, career in a very unique institution in the water space. They all have different roles and play different um, and focus on different areas within the water space. But what's really important for today is that you pay attention to what you're going to see is the underlying pattern of how they apply systems thinking to their work and the insights that they gain from using that as a tool. So for example, you're going to hear about um, water education and outreach, um, water quality. Uh, we're also going to hear about organizational capacity building and community engagement. But all of those things have at the core the application of systems thinking. And you will learn about our particular approach to systems thinking from one of our speakers today. OK, so I hope you do leave today excited about systems thinking as a concept. I know you all have something in your mind that you could apply it to. That's the theme of our conference, from think water to think x. And we'll get to think x by the end of the day. So that's very exciting to me. OK, I'm going to skip some of this. I will be your MC throughout the day. Uh, I'm going to try to highlight the connections between and among the conversations and the talks, and we'll keep going back to that sort of conceptual thread. So in the interest of time, it is my honor to introduce our keynote speaker and special guest, Charles Fishman. Uh, some years ago, Charles caught our attention with his book, The Big Thirst, um, The Secret Life and Turbulent Future of Water. And this book really took hold of America at the time that it was released. What struck us as a team, the Think Water team, was that um, he's a journalist. He's not a water scientist. And um, he really was able, in his incredibly great writing, to get people thinking about water. And he's a gifted researcher and writer. And the big thirst confirmed our hunch um, that we did need to think differently about water in and of itself. He um, urged readers to see that there's um, a lot that we still need to know. Um, and that that knowing is within our grasp. And he also said if we take a systems view of water issues, we'll um, make some better headway in the issues that we're facing. So when we learned that the, the theme of World Water Day was the answer is in nature, it was a natural fit to invite him to be our keynote. So without further delay, Charles Fishman. <laughs> missing a slide. You could leave the Thank water. You. I love that. I am. Um, 
There we go. That's your there slide. You That's my slide. Just ignore my introduction. <laughs> Good morning. I never travel without a can of Carnation Evaporated Milk. We'll, we'll get to that at the end. Um, I was in California not too long ago, and a man came up to me and said, can I tell you a story about water? And surprising as it may seem, I'm, I'm a water storyteller. That's really all I am. I, I've discovered in the last uh, six weeks that I'm a systems thinker, but I didn't know that previously. Um, but, but people rarely offer me their water stories, so I said, please, by all means, tell me a water story. Here's the story he told me. He said, until recently, I was a U.S. Navy pilot flying F-18s off the USS Kitty Hawk, a um, U.S. aircraft carrier that was then based in California. The Kitty Hawk is the last, was the last, it's been retired, was the last diesel-powered aircraft carrier in the U.S. fleet. And this man said to me, part of your job on the Kitty Hawk as an F-18 pilot was to wash your F-18 once a week with fresh water because high-performance jet fighter craft and salt water and sea air don't get along very often. But on a diesel-powered aircraft carrier, water is a very precious commodity. You have to burn diesel fuel every day to make water for 5,700 crew members who live and work on the aircraft carrier. <clears throat> In fact, that's where the term Navy shower comes from, is the reluctance of Navy captains to burn too much diesel fuel making fresh water. So this guy said, any time at the point in the week when it was time to wash the planes, that we were near a set of squalls or a, or a line of showers, the captain of the Kitty Hawk would muster us off the deck, all 82 F-18s, right into the storm. Todd Zekin is the name of the captain, in order to wash the planes off in the storm. Flaps down, landing gear down, flying through the storm to get yourself all cleaned off. Nature's own fly-through car wash, you might say. So that, that guy, Todd Zekin, the captain of the Kitty Hawk, to me was a really brilliant guy. He understood the difference between being surrounded by water and having the right water in the right place at the right time for the right purpose. He also understood something too few of us appreciate, and that is the value of a gallon of clean, fresh water. To Todd Zekin, a, a, a gallon of, of, of clean, fresh rainwater was worth more, apparently, than a gallon of aviation jet fuel. <clears throat> he understood the value of using the water at hand smartly and creatively, and he also understood the impression that he was making on his crew by making them use the available fresh water in a way that might not have otherwise occurred to them. I think in the U.S. and around the world, we are actually all living on our own version of the USS Kitty Hawk. We all have our own water scarcity problems. Very few of us have a, a, a leader as smart and determined and imaginative as the captain of the Kitty Hawk. But if we're going to have the water future we want, and in order to have the future we want, we have to have the water future we want. If we're going to have the water future we want, we are going to need that kind of leadership and energy. And we're also going to need Captain Zekin's ability to see water clearly. That's going to be the key going forward. So I'm, I'm, of course, delighted to be here. We haven't acknowledged today is, in fact, World Water Day, the great benefit of, uh, of the tremendous um, blizzard Christ, snow crisis that you all endured yesterday, <laughs> in which, um, for those watching online, uh, Washington was devastated by 2.73 inches of snow. <laughs> we all survived. Uh, but, but we, we got to postpone from the eve of World Water Day to World Water Day. Um, and, I'm, and I'm happy to be at, a, at an event called Think Water. 
I've been thinking water for eight years, so I'm glad to be in a room of people who, who spend a lot of time thinking water, and, and I want to thank Jennifer Kushner uh, and Jeremy Solon for, for thinking I'd have something to add. Um, you're not just thinking water, of course, you're thinking about how to get other people to think about water. And the question of the day, uh, uh, it, it, which is a little presumptuous of me, is really not how to get people to think about water, but how to get people to think about water differently. I'm a journalist. I spent three years traveling the world uh, to write The Big Thirst. That's a battered copy of The Big Thirst that I've been carrying around for a long time. Um, I was literally looking, searching the world for people who were, in fact, thinking differently about water. I stood at the bottom of a half million gallon water treatment tank. It, had, it was empty, but it had only just been emptied. I carried water on my head for three kilometers with the women and girls of a village in India. I wanted to see what it was like to do the water walk that we read so much about, if only once. I spent a month in India trying to understand how they approach water. I spent a month in Australia, a country that looks just like America, that had a nationwide drought that lasted a decade and remade both the water use and the national politics of the country. I spent a month in Las Vegas, a place that looks like it's cavalier about water, but actually takes water very seriously. I have been to San Pellegrino, Italy, to see where San Pellegrino water comes from, and I have been to Fiji to see where Fiji water comes from. To me, three things were obvious from this great journey, which it's obviously a privilege to be able to sort of circle the globe and, and meet people and see what they're doing. The first is that in the developed world, we have had a hundred year golden age of water, where water has been essentially unlimited, safe, and free. The golden age is over. We're moving into an era where we will have more than enough water to do what we want, and that water will be safe. But it won't be free, and we will hopefully stop using purified drinking water to do things it doesn't need to do, like flush toilets and water azaleas. So point one, we've had a golden age of water. We need a different kind of age going forward, an era of smart water. Second, especially in the United States, water is invisible. That's a tribute to the brilliant engineering of 100 years ago when our, our forefathers and mothers created the water system that we rely on. But today, that invisibility hurts us. Almost everybody in the United States is what I think of as water illiterate. We have no idea where our water comes from, how it gets to us, what happens to it when we're done with it. Um, so the invisibility, which, which, is, which is really such a joy in some ways, is now uh, a problem. You don't take care, you don't take good care of something that you never see and never think about. The invisibility is bad for us and it's bad for water. Finally, and, and, and most, most heartening, the amount of innovation going on in the world of water, out in the world, when you get out there, is just extraordinary. People are grabbing hold of and fixing their water problems at the front lines every day. And I was really heartened to see that. That's, it's happening just as we need it to happen, and it is happening. And that innovation is driving what I think of as this new era of smart water. And that's what I want to give you a little flavor of today. I want to send you out the door at the, end of, at the end of my talk, and hopefully at the end of the day as well, with three things. First, a sense of urgency about water problems. I suspect many of you live in this world every day. You do have a sense of pacing, but water problems are getting worse. They're getting worse because of population growth. They're getting worse, ironically, because economic conditions around the world are improving. Well-off people, even comfortable people, use 10 times the amount of water as poor people. That puts pressure on water supplies. And of course, they're getting worse because of climate change. So we need a sense of urgency. We have to grab hold of this problem and fix it. We have to get ahead of the problem. Uh, and and a, a sense of creativity, how that creativity happens, what we can do to make it happen. And finally, and perhaps most important, a sense that you all in this room, the folks listening online around the world, you all can make a huge difference. How we talk about water 
often determines how we use it. And so changing how we talk about it is the key to helping people change not just how they see water, but how they approach water and water problems every day. And you all are the storytellers. So how you talk about water and the stories you tell will help us have the water future we want. One of the people I met in, in, um, in my journey around the world, is kind of a, a guy I just stumbled into named Mehmood Khan. I knew nobody in India. Mehmood Khan picked me up at the airport in Delhi when I flew into Delhi uh, uh, from the US. Mehmood Khan grew up in a tiny little village, which he drove me to immediately after 18 hours on the plane. He simply put me in his car and drove me to this tiny little village 60 miles south of Delhi called Nainangla. He grew up there in the 1950s. He's about 60 now, so he grew up in the late 50s, early 60s. In those days, Nainangla had about 300 people, so 60 families maybe or, or fewer. No electricity, no refrigeration. School was a 30-minute walk each way, each day. And when Mehmood Khan came home at night, he studied by the light of a kerosene lamp in, in whatever, 1962. Nonetheless, water was not a problem in Nainangla when he was growing up. There was enough water. It was clean. There was good agriculture. No one worried about water. Mehmood Khan went on to university in India, and then he got an MBA from one of India's great business schools. And he joined straight out of uh, uh, graduate school Unilever. I'm sure everybody in the room's heard of Unilever. Unilever brings us Ben and Jerry's ice cream and also Breyer's ice cream, uh, Lipton tea, Dove soap, Q-tips, Vaseline, and that item with which the modern world could not proceed, Axe Cologne. Uh, Unilever also provides all kinds of soaps and food products in brands that we aren't familiar with, especially in the developing world. Often you can buy a single packet of, a tiny little packet of soap that looks like a, a, a pack of sugar or salt or pepper in the US or ketchup that, that costs a rupee or two rupees. So they're an essential part of our world that we don't even notice, but also an essential part of the developing world. Uh, Mahmoud Khan joined Unilever in India he went on to be in charge of all of Asia, based in Vietnam. At age 42, he landed in London in charge of innovation for a $70 billion global conglomerate. Grew up in this tiny village with no electricity and no refrigeration, ends up in London in charge of innovation for Unilever. He kept going, he went home at least every, every year and then starting in the early 2000s, he noticed that Nainangla seemed to be slipping backward. And he started going back more than once a year to see if he could help, to see what he could do about the problems, to see if he could understand them. That was in about 2003. By 2007, he was really depressed and concerned about his village. And he said to his wife, I cannot let my home village be in the condition it's in and live at the top of the pyramid in London anymore. I'm going to quit my job, and we're going to move back to India. And he now lives in this little white stucco house that he grew up in with a, with a, with a, with a cot. And he wears a, a white, uh, uh, simple white suit. And he came home to Nainangla to try and understand what was going on. The village now has 1,200 people. There is still no electricity. There is still no refrigeration. There is one store. People, the people of Nainangla collect the dung of their water buffalo every day, form it into little frisbee-like disks, set it out in the sun to dry. That is their main source of fuel for all purposes, burning the dung of their water buffalo. There are no jobs. The agriculture is not just primitive. It's in much less good condition than it was 50 years ago when Mehmood Khan was growing up. And by the way, the female literacy rate in Nainangla, the place that produced Mehmood Khan, 2%, 2%. So he came back to ask the question, what's going on? This place is, that launched me, his brother is a cardiologist in Tampa. So there was something going on, at least in the Khan family, um, had become just a quicksand of poverty. It, just, it, was, it was a miserable way of living. <clears throat> he unpacked each of the big problems he saw. Girls were illiterate 
because they spent their days walking to get water instead of going to school. Any girls who good, could go to school dropped out at age 13 in sixth grade or seventh grade because the school that was available had no bathroom. And when they got their periods, they were embarrassed to go to school, and so they stopped. The rainfall was falling. The amount of rainfall was lessening. So it was harder and harder to be a successful farmer. Because rainfall was falling, the water table was dropping. But the farmers were still using the wells, which had become brackish. So they are spraying brackish water on their fields or, or, or putting brackish water on their fields. That hurts the crops. It also poisons the soil, ruining what your, your chance of having a successful farm into the future. The overall health in the village of everybody was extremely poor. People weren't getting enough to eat. People weren't getting enough to drink, enough water to drink. And there was no sanitation at all. There were no toilets. There was no hand washing. So what Mahmoud Khan, in fact, discovered was that Nyangla didn't have an education problem or a jobs problem, an agriculture problem, or a health problem. It had a water problem. Every one of those issues could be traced right back to water. And so that's what Mahmoud Khan tackled. He, got, he tapped into this group of adolescents, 16, 17, 18-year-olds, people with a sense of expectation and energy and hope. And he actually hired them. One of those kids went looking for a place to drill a well and found a good spot to find sweet water and brought that water into the village. Khan paid for the well, but he let the kid, the guy, do all the work. That water was used to refresh two wells in town to bring them back to fresh water from brackish water. Now no one has to walk for water because there are wells right in the town that provide that water. By the way, Mahmoud Khan's father drilled those original two wells. That uh, source of water outside the village now has created a little irrigation enterprise, and so the farmers who before were having trouble raising anything and destroying their land while they were doing it are back in business, back producing really good crops. Mahmoud Khan founded two schools. He made sure all of the schools, including the secondary school, had latrines. So in the course of four or five years, he has stopped the deterioration of his village and given everybody a sense of expectation and hope by solving the water problem. You're going to spend the day today talking about and thinking about systems thinking. I nominate Mahmoud Khan as your touchstone. He knew nothing about water when he returned to Nainangla. But what he did understand as he unpacked the problems was that the water system was connected to all these other systems, the education system, the agricultural system, the sense of economic opportunity or lack of opportunity, that water infused all of that. And so you needed a sense of systems thinking to even begin to tackle the problems there. That, to me, was a kind of amazing version of what smart water looks like. Completely on the other side of the world is a story I stumbled into in the course of the book. <clears throat> the IBM microchip plant in Burlington, Vermont. Microchips, whether you, whether you all know it or not, require a kind of water to be manufactured that is found nowhere on Earth, the purest water in the world, nothing but water molecules. That's what you wash the chips with between the moments you deposit pathways. Layer, layer after layer of pathways, you have to wash the chips with water. The pathways are so small you cannot even see them with a microscope. So you have to make that water. Here's how you make that water. You take Lake Champlain lake water, which is pretty darn good already. You RO that water. That's your feedstock. Then you put the RO'd water through 12 additional filtration steps. And then you have water that literally has nothing in it except water molecules. That is an extremely expensive process. The microchip plant in Burlington is 100 acres under roof. And five of those acres are just the water factory that makes the water for the rest of the plant. Five acres, for those who don't know, is how big a big Walmart is. So 100 acres under roof for a microchip plant is a big, big factory. These chips go in 
iPhones and they go in Hewlett Packard printers, but they also go in my favorite use of computer chips, singing Hallmark birthday cards. Uh, <laughs> They're, they're very popular in our family until they wear out. Um, and of course, those birthday cards only cost $5.59. The water bill, when they started at this plant, thinking about this, was $10,959 a day. And so the people who ran the water factory for the big factory thought, we have got to do better if we're going to keep our jobs, if we're going to keep this chip plant competitive. But IBM didn't know anything about water. What IBM knows is data. So they deployed a sensor system on their water to try and understand their water system. 5,000 sensors, each gathering a data point a minute, 300,000 data points a minute, 400 million data points a day. They got a really clear picture of their water. And they ended up doing 50 different things to fix their water system once they understood what they were doing to the water, what that cost, what they did to the water after they used it. Here's an example. The chips require warm water to be, the, the, the cleaning process of that ultra pure water requires warm water. The water comes in from Lake Champlain at 57 degrees. They're spending money to warm the water before they clean it. At another part of the plant, the 57 degree water is being cooled for the HVAC system of 100 acres that needs to be air conditioned. Those two systems were not connected. Now the water comes in, it goes to the HVAC people first, then it comes to the ultra pure people. They use the cold water while it's cold, they warm it up in the process of air conditioning the plant, and then they send it warm already to the high tech water part of the factory. 50 things like that. Here was the result. They cut their water use a third, their ultra pure water use a third, while increasing production of chips at the plant by a third, they doubled the water productivity of every gallon of water. For every dollar they saved on the water bill, they saved four additional dollars in reduced chemical energy heating pumping costs. They ended up saving five million dollars a year just off the water bill. That to me is also smart water. It looks completely different than Mahmoud Khan, but it's really not. Here's how smart. In the end, IBM actually sold the microchip plant to a big microchip maker. But before they did, they created a water division, ibm.com slash water. You can hire IBM now to do for you, if you run a factory, if you run a whole university, what they did for themselves in Burlington. They thought it was so smart that they created their own water division. Here's what Mahmoud Khan and IBM did. They changed their perspective on the water they worked with every day. IBM had 13 plumbing systems in Burlington, 13 different water plumbing systems, but they didn't understand their water at all. And I think that highlights a key point about the intersection between systems thinking and water. If systems thinking is about the mental model of some part of the world that we're trying to understand and work in, the mental model we have of water is often wrong. And the mental model is often created by how we talk about water. And that's why how we talk about water matters so much. My favorite example of failed talking about water is the three word phrase, toilet to tap. No three words have done more damage to good water projects in the world than toilet to tap. We all had breakfast this morning. We all used forks and knives and spoons. I guarantee you no one in the room said, has anybody ever used this fork or spoon before? But in fact, the fork and spoon were in someone else's mouth, if not yesterday, the day before. We've all stayed in hotels. Some of you may, may have stayed in a hotel last night and woken up this morning. When you stay in a hotel, you're sleeping on linens, you're using towels and washcloths that were up against someone's body, if not yesterday, last week, the week before. No one calls the front desk and says, I need totally brand new linens in my room before I can sleep here or use the towels. We all do the dishes. We all do the laundry. We know what it means to clean dishes and, and linens, and we know they actually come out clean. Almost no one has experienced cleaning water, and so people find 
the possibility that you can clean water somehow suspect, although we all know in this room that all the water we've got is all the water we've ever had. It's all Tyrannosaurus rex P. So clearly you can clean it. In fact, it's not that hard to clean, as we also all know. When it comes to water, people have strong emotions and they have strong opinions. You can get the problem right, you can get the analysis right, you can get the science right, you can even get the solution right. But if you don't get the conversation about the problem and the science and the solution right, if you don't get the conversation right, all the rest of that stuff won't matter because you won't get to do it. My favorite antidote to the toilet to tap story, a reminder that this works just as powerfully in the other way, is the three word signs on a lot of drains. We have them here in the Washington area, storm drains, that says drains to Bay, drains to Mississippi River, drains to Lake Michigan, right? It's bold, it's clear, it's a little surprising the first time you see it, and it also works. It's actually a little piece of conversation that works effectively in the opposite direction. I want to tell you one last story. It's the story of the carnation evaporated milk. There's a factory in Modesto, California, right in the heart of the Central Valley, where they can have access to milk, that is the only carnation evaporated milk factory in North America. If there's a can of carnation evaporated milk on a grocery shelf in, in Canada, Mexico, or the United States. It came from this factory in Modesto. The factory opened in February 1993. Here's how the factory works. They make two million gallons, two, I'm sorry, two million gallons, two million cans of milk a day. To do that, they take in 400,000 gallons of raw milk. Wait for it. Here's the complicated process for making evaporated milk. Everybody should take notes. 400,000 gallons of raw milk, they evaporate half the water out, and they can what's left. That's it. That's the process. They call the evaporated water milk water. The, the concentrated milk goes in the cans. At this factory in Fresno, at this carnation factory, they also buy 88 million or have been buying 88 million gallons of water a year, 250,000 gallons of fresh water a day to run the factory, to uh, clean, to produce steam for heat, all of those things that, that go into a food factory. So in one part of the factory, they're evaporating 200,000 gallons of water a day, the milk water, and throwing it in the sewer, and paying, of course, to throw it in the sewer. At another part of the factory, they're paying to buy 250,000 gallons of water a day to run the factory. They're also paying to throw that away. In the middle of the drought, a guy named Bob Valdez, who is the chief engineer uh, at the Carnation factory, said, what in the world are we doing here? <laughs> this only took 25 years. It was 2016. That carnation plant has now, if it hasn't become a zero water factory at this moment, it will in the next few months. They are going to use the water that they have been evaporating off the milk and throwing away to run the factory. Why not? By the way, it's called milk water, but it's actually pretty clean at the moment it flashes up off the milk, right? It's evaporate. They are going to cut themselves off from the big pipe. In some places, that would be a financial disaster for the water utility. In Modesto, in the middle of the drought, the city and the community could not have been happier about this initiative. By the way, the people who work in that factory, they live in that town. They're not somewhere else. So that, to me, is obviously a brilliant example of smart water. It didn't require any, it, all it required was drawing the circle a little bigger, was thinking a little differently about how you do what you do every day. And by the way, talk about low hanging fruit, right? Talk about doing, not, not looking up from your work every day. Every time I see a can of, of carnation evaporated milk in the grocery, I just smile. I just think that is such a wonderful example of there are still many things that are actually not even that hard to do uh, that, that will make a huge difference. So what connects Todd Zekin, the captain of the USS Kitty Hawk, Mahmoud Khan, the, the, the senior executive who returned to his own village in India, Janet Bombardier, who ran the water facility at IBM and her group of engineers, and Bob Valdez from Carnation? 
What connects them is they widened their perspective. They, drew, they did draw the circle a little bigger around, what, around their work and their water. They got curious about what role water played and what they could understand about it. They asked questions. They saw their water situation clearly. That's point one. They realized that water does not respond to wishful thinking. This is one of, one of the emotional barriers to the way humans approach water. There is no water main leak. There is no leak in your roof. There is no drought that ever ended because we wished that it would end. Water problems only get worse. You have to tackle them. You have to see your situation clearly and then jump on it. The secret about water, which everybody in this room, I suspect, knows, is, as I said, that every water, so every water problem is solvable. We do not need Silicon Valley. We do not need a moonshot for water. The hard part about water is typically not the water part or the technical part. And sad to say, it's not even usually the money part. It's the people part. It's the part about how you get people to see the problem clearly and then understand the range of solutions and the opportunity. Those four people, Todd Zekin, Mahmoud Khan, Janet Bombardier, Bob Valdez, they saw something they hadn't seen before, and then they mustered both the leadership and the storytelling to get their community to the solution. I want to finish with a point I haven't mentioned, but I think you all should keep in mind not just today, but as you go back to your own work. Water is, of course, really magical stuff. If you work with it every day, it's easy to lose track of that. But every cell in our body, every millisecond, requires water. We're only alive and thinking and paying attention because of water. Water creates snowflakes, as we found out yesterday. It also creates the incredible power of Niagara Falls. We use water to grow wheat and make concrete. But anybody who's stepped under a hot shower at the end of a long day, anybody who's seen their kids leap into the ocean or the lake in the middle of July or August, we use water to feel better, to relax, to play. We have, as people, a strong emotional connection to water. And I think that is also key, that emotional connection. The theme of World Water Day today is the answer is in nature. We tend, as we approach water problems, or we have tended to think that water is an engineering issue. But that doesn't work. That approach doesn't work. If it, if it did work 100 years ago, it doesn't work in an era of scarcity and competition, an era when we need public support and public buy-in for wherever we're headed with solving water problems. One piece of wisdom we can take from nature is that nature always tells the truth. As my friend Cynthia Barnett, some of you may know her book, Blue Revolution, she's a water journalist, as she says, quote, nature can break through constructed reality. Whether the constructed reality is an engineered reality or whether it's a fake news reality, nature can help us see water clearly and help us help the rest of the world see water clearly. And it can also help us tell the right stories to solve water problems. We, of course, are part of nature, too. Last night, I came to dinner, which was, which was just great. And I met Art Gold, who's a hydrologist from the University of Rhode Island. And he, he literally told me this fascinating observation right as I sat down at the dinner table. He said, when he meets someone, like on a plane, and, and tells them what he does, that he's a hydrologist, that he deals with water problems, they immediately think that he can help them solve their water problem. If they're a farmer worried about irrigation and runoff, if there's somebody concerned about ocean pollution or wetlands restoration or just adequate clean drinking water, they assume Art, Art, Art's a water guy. He must have the water, the water solution. And I, I had never heard someone say that about people and their relationship to water before in years of conversations. But he's exactly right. People want to have a good relationship with water. They want enough water. And they want to get the water solution right. That's, I think, our instinct. And that comes from our emotional connection. We are part of nature. But that, 
Willingness to step up and do the right thing is human nature. And I think if you all can harness that, we will, we will get to the solutions that will get everybody the water they need. Thank you very much.